Well, good morning again. Didn't they do an amazing job? Let's give them one more hand. Yeah, I, I don't know some of y'all parents, but those kids have some expressions on their face. They get that from mom and dad, I guess, probably, but that's so cool. I love it. Thank you again to Miss Aubrey and the volunteers. I, they just, I'm, an awesome job. Uh, love those kids. We are, uh, I'm just grateful to be here. We're going to try to, we're doing something this different this week. Uh, who is, we're getting ready to actually take a road trip. Uh, we're leaving tomorrow at 4.30, I think, uh, about 4.30 or 5. Starting a new series called Summer Road Trip. And uh, has anybody uh, got a summer road trip plan this summer? I don't know. There's something about a road trip that I love, but we're getting ready to take one tomorrow on a bus with about 40 high school students and volunteers. So I'm super, I'm super excited. Cheryl's got me saying it now. But we we are excited about that. Sorry, I'm excited about this series. It's the first day of summer is June 20th, so, but we're going to kick off with this road trip. Anybody ever, uh, did anybody take road trips uh, with your family as a kid? Anybody ever do that? Like, I remember when I was a senior, or actually, I was a sophomore in high school, and I just turned 16 years old, and my parents, uh, we went to California for two weeks uh, on a road trip with my brothers, just my mom and dad and my, and my three brothers, and uh, it was miserable. Anybody, like, anybody know, like, like, you just, you fight, back, we didn't have phones, you kids today, you know, we were just like, he crossed the line, he, you know, you know, the invisible line, but it was just the smell, and like, and the whole, like, I think we have some pictures, like, this is, uh, this is some documented, yes, and I put the short in shorts, so, um, I don't know what was up with my attire there. It was the 80s, people. You've got them, too. <laughs> brutal, brutal trip. I remember we stopped at Lambert's. I think it was on that trip with our, our like, custom van there, and we slid that side door open, and it just kept sliding and fell off on the ground. Like, <laughs> and my dad, we picked it up, and my dad, I don't know, wired it with a coat hanger or something. But uh, we spent the rest of the trip on that trip. It was just brutal. We, like, we had our uh, Sony Walkmans and our cassette that just ate the batteries. You guys, you, you remember those? That's what we had. And uh, so what, I, don't, I think there was a post on our social media. What's your favorite road trip snack? Like, what is it? Like, you guys, everybody has a favorite, like, road trip snack. I know Cheryl's is, uh, like, Twizzlers and peanut M&Ms, and they just uh, annoying. Like, peanut, I remember one time Cheryl spilled all of her peanut M&Ms, and they went into the like the, the vents of our car. And so for years, like every time you turned a corner, you heard the peanut M&Ms rolling <laughs> around <laughs> in the car. Uh, we, uh, when Cheryl and I got married, we took a road trip for our honeymoon. We went to Florida. We had no idea where we were going. And uh, it was before like the internet, you know, we had a book, like a coupon book from the bank that we got when we opened the account. And uh, we had a cooler full of diet dues, uh, wheat thins, and some squeeze cheese. Like that stuff is just good stuff. But it's just like, so for the next few weeks, we're going to we're gonna just road trip through the Bible. And we're going to walk through uh, scripture and uh, it's going to be good. I'm excited for some of us. It'll be a time to review some of these stories. Uh, some of you uh, may be the first time you've heard any of these stories, uh, but either way, it's going to be a journey, and it's really, it, it, when you take a road trip through the Bible or you road trip anywhere, it's about the journey. It's, about, it's not necessarily about the destination or where we're headed. It's just about enjoying the journey and enjoying where you're at and doing what, doing what you uh, can do, but I'm just so excited for this. Um, when you look at the Bible, uh, there is a, shall we hand me a There's a, I forgot to bring that up here. So there was a uh, uh, great football coach, Vince Lombardi, and he, when he started, uh, one of my, the, the beginnings to one of his most famous speeches to his team was just foundational. And he started that, that, that he, he, had this compelling story about how he started this, uh, with, he was talking to his team, Vince Lombardi, coach of the Green Bay Packers, and he started with a very fundamental uh, saying. He, he basically said, uh, guys, this, he held up a football and he said, this is a football. <laughs> it was very fundamental. And this, people, is a Bible. 
and we're going to walk through it, and, and we're going to walk through this story. There's, the Bible is so cool. It's, it ha, it's basically a story uh, uh, of God's creation, of his relationship with his creation, and if you understand how to read the Bible, it will take on such different meaning for you. It's, it's a difficult thing to read sometimes, but if you read that, Max Licato, actually uh, many of you have seen it, uh, wrote, a, wrote, wrote the Bible in a novel format. It's called The Story. I don't know if you've ever walked through that or not, but here's what Max Licato says. He said, this book, and he's talking about the Bible, uh, he said, this book tells the grandest most compelling story of all time. It is the story of a true God who loves his children, who established them for a way of salvation, and has provided a route to eternity. He, our roadmap is in this Bible through our, our, our uh, through where we're headed. And so in the weeks ahead, we're going to visit some of those major events and talk about that. And we're going we're gonna to talk about some of those major stories. We're going to revisit some of those stories like Daniel and Goliath and Noah and the whale and Jonah and the ark. And we're going to explore messages from Hezekiah out of the Old Testament. And we're going to be fascinated with characters like Shadrach and Meshach and to bed we go. But we're going to walk through this Bible together. And Romans, when we come to the realization that the same God throughout all of these stories is still active and present in our world today, it makes a difference. His word still has value in our life. His word, this word of God is alive. It's more than just a book. It's a roadmap for our our lives. And we will get a clear picture of the upper story and the lower story because the Bible is full of stories. And there's an upper story and then there's a lower story to this, to this Bible. There's the upper story that God sees, but there's the lower story that is our lives and what we experience every day uh, throughout the day. And what makes it, what we hear makes a difference. It's a source of what we hear. So uh, before we get too far, let me, let me back up uh, and correct something. I just, I rattled off some of those stories and some of you were probably thinking, oh, our pastor is, needs to be fired right? Some of you picked up on that, but some of you probably didn't. Uh, It is not actually Daniel and Goliath, is it? It's David and Goliath. But the fact is, some of you knew that, and the fact is, some of you did not. Some of you, you had no idea who, what that was wrong. I heard some people chuckle, and some people didn't. Um, Noah and the whale, Jonah and the ark. It's, it's not Noah and the whale. It's Jonah and the whale and Noah and the ark, right? Some of us know that, but some of us don't. And that's okay. I want you to feel safe. This is a place where we learn. Uh, and, and I think that's hard for people. That's actually one of the things that's so difficult. And we're trying really hard to be a church for unchurched people here. So if you're an unchurched person, if you're not somebody that grew up in church like I did, that's okay. You're, you're fine. We're going to walk through this together. We're going to spend some time together. There's no pressure to know anything, but we want to teach you what God's Word says, and we want you to be able to appreciate some of the stories that we grew up learning for those of us who had the privilege to grow up in church and in a church environment. We're going to explore the passages from Hezekiah. Some of you didn't pick up on that. That is not a book in the Bible. (laughs) Hezekiah is not a book in the Bible. Uh, uh, we're going to be fascinated. Like it's not Shadrach, Meshach, and to bed we go. It's Abednego, is his name. But we're going to learn some of that, and we're going to go to the foundation, and we're going to get back to the foundation of what church is, and and that you know. Actually, I was doing some research on this today. And if you're here and you're sitting in this, you're sitting here and you're going, man, I really don't. It makes me uncomfortable that I don't know a lot of the Bible stories. I, I, I don't want to, and really for a lot of reasons, when we launch groups again in the fall, it'll be the reason that many of you will not engage in a small group. I hear that all the time. People don't engage in a small group because they don't want to be the guy in the circle that doesn't know anything. And that's okay. We're, this is a safe environment. We got, we're all on a different journey in our journey with Jesus Christ. Some of us are further down the road, and that's okay too. We love you. But those of us that are further down the road, we need to be teaching and sharing what we've learned throughout the years of, of studying God's Word. And so 
next 10 weeks, I've typically never done a series this long, but for the next 10 weeks, we are going to road trip from start through the finish of the Bible. We're going to road trip all the way up to Jesus and the importance of, of this story. And hopefully over, that, over these 10 weeks, you're going to get an opportunity. Maybe some of you will get an opportunity to learn a little bit about what the Bible stories are and how they connect to your life practically in 2024, that they're not just a bunch of cool stories, uh, that it's not made up, it's not a fairy tale, that there is a pattern to it that we'll begin to see. Through all of these stories, there is a pattern in God's Word and what we begin to see. There's an upper story and a lower story. But I was doing some research on this topic, just about uh, you know fundamental knowledge of, of Scripture and, and what the Bible says. And I was reading an article, and it says, this is by Kenneth Birding, who's a theologian. He said, Americans, by and large, don't read the Bible regularly. And that's just true. Some of you have Bibles sitting on your nightstand at home. Some of you got a bookshelf. They're covered in dust. It's been so long since you've ever really picked it up. And when the last time you did pick it up, you, you just did the, I'm going to plop it open and read something and point my finger. And then you get to where like Song of Solomon's and then you're like, oh man, what have I just read? And if you anybody know Song of Solomon's, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, but here he says, by and large, Americans don't read the Bible regularly, and they lack a basic knowledge of people, stories, themes that point to the coming of Christ saving the world. Jesus doesn't mean anything to you because you don't understand what's been going on since the beginning and how everything points to Jesus in Scripture. And, and I want to try to help with that. So it, it also says that research has shown that most Americans could not name the four Gospels. They, they just don't know. Some of you are here going, oh, man, that's me. <laughs> I don't want to. I'm nervous. I hope he doesn't call on us. What are the four Gospels? They're Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It also says that most Americans would, be, would struggle to name more than two or three of the disciples or even half of the Ten Commandments. The famous pollster George Barna said, no wonder people break the Ten Commandments all the time. They don't know what they are. And a lot of us are there. Like, could you name those? Are you reading your Bible? I believe we are living in a time in our country where biblical literacy may very well be the answer to many of the problems of our, that the world needs or is facing today. If we would just understand God's word and just spend some time in it and get somebody to help you understand it, it's okay that you don't understand it. Don't be intimidated by it. There's a great song we used to sing growing up in the church, and I'll probably catch, you know, we, we sing hymns, and I love our worship set that we sing. Uh, but some of you grew up in church, sang a song called How Firm a Foundation. Does anybody remember singing? Some of y'all could sing it with me, right? How firm a... You know, right? You, sing, you know the words. Here's, here's what it says. If you don't know the words, here's what the, the first verse of that song says. How firm a foundation, O saints of the Lord, is laid... For your faith in his excellent word. Our foundation of who we are as believers and followers of Jesus Christ are laid in the foundation of what we find in Scripture. And if you're not reading it and digesting it on your own, if all of the Scripture that you're getting is what I'm giving you on Sunday morning, you are spiritually starving to yourself to death. And so there's this foundation. It says, What more can he say than to you he has said? who unto a Savior for refuge have fled. Like there's, God has said everything he needs to say in this word to us. He has, it's amazing. I, 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 one, of the, one of the classes I took in, on my path to ordination was a church history course. It was a, a two-part course. One of the most fascinating courses I've ever taken in my life. If you ever do any research on, on how the church ended up being where it is today from where it started, it's incredible. It, it, when you understand the persecution and the people that did, tried to destroy God's word, it is by no accident that we still have this Bible. 
It is by no accident that his word is in my hand. It is divine. It was set with a purpose. He gave it to us for for instructions on how we should live. And so we're going to dive, we're going to dig into that over these next 10 weeks. And I'm, I'm, I'm excited about it. It's going to be fun. Um, you know, the thing about everybody loves a good story, don't you? Like if I told a story, everybody loves a story. Um, there is no greater story than God's word and the story that God and his creation and what he's done for us and through, and through us. And the, the Bible, we're going to start at the very beginning today. The, Bi- the Bible begins with this amazing, interesting account of how God created the world. And so we're going to start, if you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to bring them to church with you. We're going to dig into it. If you open your Bible and it's in the very first thing it says in Genesis 1-1 is what? Some of you know it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Simple verse, Genesis 1-1. We can't start any farther back than that. <laughs> It, it starts right there. And so typically, that's a verse that maybe you learned in Sunday school. Like you were one of these kids maybe that went to day camp and you had a teacher or a Sunday school teacher or some teacher in day camp that taught you that in the beginning, God created the earth. And so it, it seems like a very simple verse. You maybe have learned that at some point in time in, you know, at Bible school, some of these kids that were taught but there is so much more. I was telling the band this morning, I, I dug into this and I actually had the whole first point in my sermon on, on that one verse because there is so much in that one verse. Like when you start digging into that and you understand the, the level of Hebrew that is underneath that and every Hebrew word has a significance with it. If you were Hebrew, you would understand how planned and how organized God is and the sovereignty that he has. It, it's just really cool. Um, if you were Hebrew, you would understand. We're not gonna dig into that deep this t- today, but I'm always amazed at how much is underneath these scriptures that we read really quickly. And if you would pause and do some study on that, your mind would be blown. Um, Let's go to verse two. It says, the earth was formless and empty and darkness covered the deep water and the spirit of God. This is really cool. The Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the water. So before anything existed, before there was anything, before there was space and time, and, and, and this is hard for us as humans to get our head wrapped around that God just was. He was there. His Spirit was hovering. And what's cool is it's the same Holy Spirit that lives within us today. It's the same thing. It was God in three persons. And so we have this incredible, from there you get this incredible story of creation. You keep reading down through Genesis and you'll learn in verses one through three that on the first day he created light and darkness. And what's cool when you read through this story of creation, at the end of everything that he created, the Bible says God looked at it and it says that he he thought light was good. And then on day two, in verses four through nine, we see the space. He created this space between the waters and he separated the heavens and the earth and land and sky appeared. And God looked at it and said it was good. And then on the third day, verses 11 through 12, he created all the vegetation and seed-bearing plants and trees that would naturally reproduce over and over. And he looked at it and he thought it was good. And on day four, he created the stars and the moon. And God saw it was good. And then on the fifth day, he created birds and fish and sea creatures. In verses 20 through 22 in chapter one, he created birds and fish and sea creatures. And God saw it was good. And then on day six, he created all the animals. And then he created his most prized possession, us. And the Bible says in that particular scripture that he thought it was very good. It wasn't just good. It was very good. It says then in verse Genesis chapter 1, 31, he says, then God looked all over all he had made and he saw it was very good. And evening passed and morning came, marking the sixth day. And then we skip to chapter 2 in Genesis. It says, so, cre- so the creation of heaven and earth and everything in them was completed. 
And on the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation, so he rested from his works. Anybody go home after church and take a nap, or is that just me? Like, we have a thing in the church of the Nazarene. It's called a Nazarene nap. And, like, everybody just takes a nap on Sunday afternoon. I don't know why. I'm not going to get one today, but I'm kind of bummed out about it. But there's a reason that we pause and there's a whole nother message that I could preach on, on this rest that we need. And I'm telling you what, if there's, any of, if there's a country that needs it, it's us. Like we, we book our schedules so stinking tight that we have forgotten how to rest. And if, if God himself needed to rest, guess what? You do too. And we need to place some value on rest. It's almost like we've gotten in culture where if somebody takes a vacation, it's like, oh boy, John's going to take a vacation this week. No, take your vacation. Do it. Hang up your phone. Get in a blue van with some really short shorts and drive across the country with your family and rest and learn how to rest. It's important. So why we take this, it's why we take this one day of the week, and we've even crowded Sundays so full of junk now. I mean, it used to be sacred. It's not anymore. It used to be that we, like, our culture, our culture has run right over Sunday. And we, we've prioritized everything in the world above just rest. He rested from all of his work, and God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy because it was the day he rested from the work of creation. But it all started with four words, and the four words were, in the beginning, God. And I know you can read that really quickly and completely miss how heavy that is. And how important those four words are. Let me just tell you, from the very beginning it was God. The Hebrew name is mentioned in that, actually that passage. It's called, it's Elohim. The name for God is, was in a plural form. Meaning Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They all existed in the beginning. It signifies his strength and his might that he is three in one. He's a community among himself. He was around before you and around before me and around before anyone or anything. He was around long before day and night and time itself. And it's hard to get your head wrapped around that. But our God is big and powerful and he can create anything he desires from a single word. And we can miss that. I think sometimes we take for granted this God that we serve and how big and mighty he is. And what he's capable of doing. That is what we call the sovereignty of God. It means he's omnipotent. That's a big church word. It means he, he has unlimited power. He is omniscient. Another big church word. It just means he knows everything. It means, and then that he's omnipresent, means that he's everywhere. There's not a place or a hole or a darkness or anywhere that you can run that you can escape the presence of God in your life. So we have, the, so after God created the world, he created human beings and he saw that it was very good. Verse 27, God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. There's a whole lot there. I'm going to leave that. Go. I'm just going to let that lay where it's at. Okay? We are God's greatest creation. You are God's greatest creation. He has put us in charge of creation. If you read it, you will see that God made all this stuff, and then he made man, and he said, hey, listen, you're in charge of all of it. We were entrusted to care for and to rule over all that he created. But we, above all that he created, above all the magnificent, magnificent, I can't even say the word, you get it. <laughs> above all the cool things <laughs> that he's created, we are the best. You are the best. It says it in Ephesians chapter 2.10. It says, for we are God's masterpiece. 
He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things that he has planned long ago. He doesn't make mistakes despite what you see in the mirror. He created you exactly the way you are for a specific purpose. He has an amazing plan for us. He will not force that plan on you, however. And we have to make the choice to be in a relationship with him. And sometimes that's a difficult choice to make because we are tempted and pulled by evil and by this world. Um, I have a video. Do you ever make something or create something you're really proud of? Uh, do, we, do you have any puzzle people in here? People that work puzzles? Anybody? What's the best part of the puzzle? It's when you push the last piece, right? Like you work all so hard at it and then finally you get it all down and there's one last. I have a video. Let me show you a video really quick. <laughs> it's funny. It's not funny. Uh, who would be mad? That would just, that would tick me right off. Uh, I mean, the whole time it takes you to put all that together and create all of that and then just have somebody just completely mess it up. It's kind of what happened in creation. God created this. There's another side of the creation story that impacts all of us today. God forms this earth and fills it with animals and human. It's amazing. I mean, it's, it's glorious. God has created the Garden of Eden, which was, I can't imagine what that would have been like. And he created man and woman to live in it. And however, when you read in chapter 2 and 3 of Genesis, it kind of takes a different turn. And God tells a pair of naked humans to refrain from eating from a tree. They get ejected from the garden for disobeying God because they listened to a talking serpent. Read the story. It's cool. It's commonly referred to in church world as the fall. You have the creation, and then you have the fall. Because basically, God had created this beautiful picture. And we're getting ready to place the last piece. And then, in our choices, we just wiped it off the table. And made a giant mess of everything that God had wanted to create in our lives. And you, Siri's talking to me. At the moment that Adam and Eve made the choice to disobey God was at the moment that they ruined this beautiful thing that God had wanted to create because he gave you and I free choice. And we look at them and go, what a bunch of idiots. And yet we make the same choice every week. We take everything that God wants for us and has created for us to, to enjoy and to fulfill our lives and to be full, and we go, nope, I want to do it my way. And we wipe it off the table. This is the fall. This is the part of the story that Adam and Eve said, you know what? God told us, to. Do, he gave us all of this stuff. And he just asked us to just refrain from eating from the... It's like telling... You ever... Like, I'm going to pick on... I won't tell you who it is. I want to really bad. But we, we got some security around our church, and we have these little buttons. They're panic buttons that we can press. They're here this morning, and they know who they are, and I'm not going to call them out. But it's like this button, and we're just curious. And we're like, people are like, oh, I wonder what that is. And they would push it, and the police would show up. 
Like it over and over, the police kept showing up. And then finally the police were like, we're going to have to charge you if people keep pushing the button. I feel like it was that way in the garden. It's like, what do you want to do? Don't push that button. Oh, okay. Oh. So what we do is go, we're bent toward evil. We have been created with this sinful nature that needs to be defeated in us. Genesis chapter 3, verse 7 says this, At the moment their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame. So the moment that they ate the apple, and they pushed the button, and they disobeyed God's perfect plan for us, is when it all fell apart. And they knew it instantly. You ever do that? Have you ever made a decision, and you know it's the wrong thing instantly? And the Holy Spirit is telling you, boy, you should not be doing that. You ever do that? Happens to us all the time, doesn't it? That's exactly what Adam and Eve felt. We'll read it, chapter 3, verse 7. At the moment, their eyes were opened. And they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. And this, is, this next part's the... One of my, honestly, it's one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. Genesis chapter 7, verse 8. It's just so much here. I could go all for weeks on this one story. But God would, the Bible says that God would walk with Adam in the garden. What a cool picture. You could just stroll around and walk with God. What an amazing place to eat. And when Adam's choice messed that up. In verse 8 it says, When the cool of the evening breezes were blowing, and that was the time that he would walk with God, the man and his wife heard the Lord walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Some of you are still hiding. God is wanting to walk with you. He's, he wants to have a relationship with you. But because of your sin and because of the dumb stuff that we do, we hide from Him. We don't want to be at church. We don't want to be around people who are believers. We don't, because we know, and some of you know, that God wants a relationship with you and you're hiding from Him. Adam did. That's the fall. But there's a third part of the creation story. You have creation. You have the fall. It's like, watching, it's like watching a movie. When you watch a movie and the hero starts to get beat up at the end, but you know the hero's going to win. It's kind of what happens here in this creation story. It's really cool. There's more to this story. After they ate from the tree of good and evil, and after they pushed the button and they hid from God, there were consequences for that. And there were consequences for them to get booted out of the garden. The consequence for Adam and Eve was they could no longer live in the Garden of Eden. In fact, the Bible says that they kicked them out and that God placed an angel at the entrance to keep people from entering. And so when we make a decision to disobey God in our life, it creates a barrier between us and God. But here's the cool thing, is that God has created a way for us back in the garden. And, he, and it's, it, it's captured in Genesis, which is crazy to me. It's just the beginning of time. There were consequences for Adam and Eve's choices. God and God, it's, it's captured in Genesis chapter 3. God has a conversation with each of the three guilty parties. He has a conversation with Adam. He has a conversation with Eve. And he has a conversation with the serpent that tempted them both. And all three of those conversations are captured in, in our Bible. Genesis chapter 3. Here's what it says. Genesis chapter 3 verse 16. Then he said to the woman... This was God's conversation to Eve for her part in, in pushing the button. Here's what he said. Then he said this to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy. 
and in pain you will give birth. And you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. Amen. No, just kidding. (laughs) Was that out loud? Sorry. (laughs) There were consequences. There were consequences for Eve's action. Here's what he said to the man. Because really, in this story, we want to look at it and go, well, if Eve didn't eat the ap- stupid apple, we wouldn't be in this mess. But the fact of the matter is, God put Adam in control. He was the head of this place, and he let it happen. And some of you men and husbands are not spiritual leaders in your home. Your wife is dragging you along. God created us men to be spiritual leaders in our home. Here's what he said to Adam. This is what he said to the man, since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you, and all of your li- all your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. Pretty strong words. There were consequences. There are consequences to our disobedience. We will reap what we sow. We have to own the sin that we have. We have to live with some of those decisions. Some of the decisions that we've made, honestly, will outlive you. They're impacting your kids and the next generation. They have impact other than on others. It's more than just impact on us. The decisions that we make have impacts on other people. And and some of that will outlive you. You will be remembered long after you're gone for some of the decisions that you've made. Here's what he said to the serpent. He said, and I will cause you, in verse 15, and I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And this is a powerful verse, passage of Scripture. Keep in mind, this is in the third chapter of Genesis. This is the first mention of Jesus. It says you will strike he will strike your head and, and he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. That is a direct reference to Jesus. The serpent's going to strike Jesus' heel on a cross, but he's going to step on his head because Jesus wins. And there is redemption. There is redemption and forgiveness because God planned it from the very beginning for his son to pay the price for your and I's decisions that are bad. And that is huge. It's not the end. The end of the story is awesome. There is redemption. God promised that the offspring of Eve, which would be Jesus, would defeat Satan. He promised that there would be redemption of their lives and that they could overcome the enemy. And that, my friends, is good news. It's called the gospel. The good news would be fulfilled by the coming of God's son, Jesus, to pay for our sins once and for all and defeat the enemy and defeat sin and defeat Satan and the enemy in our lives. That is more than just good news. That is great news. Despite our stupid decisions, despite the magnitude and impact of them, there is forgiveness and redemption if we choose it. There's a uh, closing. I'll just read this. There's a quote I read this week. It's from Kyle Kurtz. And he says this. If readers, when you read this, creation story. He says, if readers aren't careful, they might get caught up in thinking this is a simple origin tale, meaning it's just about creation and just as simple about how God created the world. Or the first of many ancient stories in the Old Testament that is meant to teach a moral lesson. When you read the creation story, you think that's all it's about. Well, this is how the world came about and we're off and running. He goes on and says this, however, the first few chapters of Genesis have several elements that are repeated in biblical narrative, and it gives readers more insight into the events of the Old Testament. 
when you truly understand the creation story and the theme of that story, that there was creation, that God created something new, there, and then there was this fall, and then there was redemption, you will see that theme over and over and over and over again in the Bible. As we walk through these next nine weeks together, you're going to see that theme over and over and over. That God creates in us. He does something new in us. Then we do something stupid. And then he redeems us. What a beautiful story. This is a story that has played out over and over. And in the story, it has been written from the beginning of the world. And from the very beginning, God made a provision through his son, Jesus. He had a plan. In the beginning, God... In the beginning, God had a plan, and he so loved us that he created a plan for our redemption and our salvation. And that, my friends, is great news this morning. Stand with me. Father, thank you so much for your word and what it teaches us. And Lord, sometimes it's easy just to read this, this creation story and go, well, that's kind of cool about how God created the earth. But Lord, we know there's so much more than that there. There's this story of, of our failure. God, we have it. There may be somebody here this morning that's struggling with, with that. They look at their life and, and they sit here and go, man, I don't know any of these stories and I, I don't belong here and I don't, I don't I, God, I just know that you know them. And Father, I just pray over the next few weeks when we begin to dig back in through some of these stories and through some of these events where you have shown your faithfulness and your judgment and your, and your correcting, correcting us as humans. Lord, I just pray, Lord, that we would learn from that, that we would apply it to our lives. Lord, help us to be thankful for the creation that you've created each one of us in your image for a specific purpose. Um, Lord, help us to find that purpose in our life and to work within what you would have us to do. Uh, help us to be the kind of church that reaches out to lost people in our, in our community. Uh, help us to invite our friends so that they might come to know this good news as well. Thank you for loving us the way you do, Jesus. In your precious holy name I pray. Amen. I think we do probably need to tear down some chairs, so if somebody wants to help us do that today, that would be great. Have a great week.